Hello and welcome to the show with me, Gillian Gotzel. Today, my guest is Tim Draper. Now, Tim needs no introduction. Only if you're listening to this and you don't know who he is, maybe you're on the wrong podcast. Or actually, hand on a moment, hang on here because you could learn something. So Tim, you are very, very well known, a bit of a legend, VC, billionaire, and investing in Bitcoin since 2014. Um, that's a short introduction. So mm. looking forward to- 2012, but who's counting? <laughs> we'll have a question about that later. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I hope you haven't been asked them too many times before. And I look forward to our next little while together. So first of all, we know you can pick winners, right? You, you, you picked, you know, pre-Bitcoin, it was Hotmail, Skype, Tesla, SpaceX. Then you've been invested in Coinbase and Ledger and Tezos. So you've got a huge, and, and 50 other ones, I may add. So you've got a huge track record. My question is, I know you get asked all the time. I pick losers you, too. That's my question. I know you pick winners all the time, but how do you pick losers? When you look back on the losers that you've picked, is there anything that 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 you go, ah, I should have seen that. That's what the loser the loser client is. Um, no, I mean, I guess uh, the ones that don't, I mean, there, there are two sets of losers, one where they go completely out of business and one where they just don't get us our money back. Um, and then there are the winners and there are some that make us a couple times on the money and some that make us a thousand times on the money. And they're, they all kind of have different qualities. But um, I think to win, um, entrepreneurs have to build trust amongst themselves, their team, their employees, their customers. So trust is a big thing. Um, they have to feel free to innovate. They can't feel like they're overwhelmed by government regulations or whatever. And they, um, and I think that they have to um, have a, a single decision maker, but at least a de single decision maker in each category of, of business um, and with sort of faith amongst the team. I think that makes a big difference. And I, it's hard for me to read that when I first meet the entrepreneur. Um, now, the other thing is that the big winners are usually the ones that um, are a little bit odd at first where it's just like, whoa, what are you doing? It's, it's something where it's a little different. Um, you know, free web-based email, what? What are you thinking? <laughs> you know, that was, that was Hotmail. Skype was a little odd too. They actually changed their model um, on the fly just before we wrote the check. Um, they, uh, and they, they had both come from uh, Kazaa, which was uh, so they couldn't even come into the U.S. because of the uh, uh, they would have would have had to go to court right away with the music industry. Um, Tesla, I mean, the idea of starting another car company, DeLorean was a total disaster. So were all those other car companies in the U.S. between 19 whatever 60 and now, and, and Tesla. Um, SpaceX, we were shooting rockets. Really? <laughs> I mean, what 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 are we all thinking? Um, and so we, um, so I would say, the ones that really won big were the ones where it was long odds at some extraordinary outcome, where uh, the market size was very high. And um, hang on just a second. I think somebody's at the door. If you can just like I don't know, cut or whatever. Sorry, this stuff happens. No, it's when, real life. When you're when you're at home instead in the home office, you get the doorbell every once in a while. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
anyway, so wacky. yeah, you can. And, and then um, I think a lot of a lot of times companies don't succeed because the entrepreneurs are not getting along. They both think they should be CEO. They both are second guessing each other on the technology, that kind of thing. Um, they and they run out of money often um, because they they don't anticipate how much money they're going to need as they go forward, uh, or they're or it, it they just can't articulate it. But usually, if an entrepreneur makes twenty five pitches, by the twenty fifth pitch, they are uh, they are articulating beautifully exactly what they're their business is and what the model is and how big the market is and what the competition looks like. And they're ready to go. Um, so so you, yeah, usually failure is a, a lot of failure is not just running out of money. It's, it's the people. And it's not apparent from the beginning. You, it, it's, it's hard to pick out why you, yeah. So it's not, it's, it's an ongoing process. I mean, carrying on that theme with some of your, you, you, you've seeded like, I think uh, 30 unicorns. Now, apart from the little horn in the middle of the head, is there anything that you can see in a company that you think this this could fly? This, I mean, like as opposed to just a successful everyday run of the mill investment, do what, what things get get you sort of you know shivers down your spine or or other projects? Like, Ooh. Yeah, um, it's usually um, I see. I'm a little different from other venture capitalists, and that may be because. I'm a seed venture capitalist and I kind of have entrepreneur in my blood. Mm. Um, I look for people with that entrepreneur in their blood, the, the something's got to change here. Let's get this done. And, uh, and it, it drives them. And so I can see it in their eyes or in their heart when I ask them, why are you doing this? But the other thing I, I find is that, um, I, a lot of venture capitalists don't, they look and they say, what could go wrong? In mm. fact, it was your first question. Mm. Um, and I say, what if it works? And, and if it works and it's still meh, still nothing, then don't bother. But if it works and something really extraordinary happens to humans and society, then it might be worth a try. Okay, I like that. So in the recent news, well, not that recent, the last little while, with El Salvador adopting Bitcoin as a currency and a lot of other uh, South American countries coming. Yeah, through. yeah, I think Panama is following. Yeah, and, Uruguay and Paraguay and... And uh, Ukraine. Ukraine today, I think there was something, yeah, or this, this week. Yeah. Do you think like, obviously when El Salvador came out, the World Bank and the IMF would, oh, one don't like that, you know, your loan's in danger. How, how, do, you think, how do you think it'll play out? Obviously these are kind of vulnerable countries, but how do you think it'll play out for them? Yeah, you know, that's funny because I, I talked to the, um, the former president of um, Argentina, Macri, and I had a great conversation with him about Bitcoin. And, uh, and then I saw him two years later and I said, you know, since we, Bitcoin was at 10,000 for the first time when I first met him. And then uh, two years later, it was down to 4,000. And I told him again about Bitcoin. And I said, you know, actually, since we've been together, Bitcoin's fallen from 10,000 to 4,000, but the Argentinian peso has gone from 75 cents down to 25 cents. So. I'll make you a bet that if if the Argentinian peso outperforms Bitcoin, I'll double my investment in Argentina. And he goes, okay. And then I said, but if uh, Bitcoin outperforms the Argentinian peso, then uh, you have to make the make Bitcoin your national currency. And he didn't bet with me, and it was because of that he was concerned about the IMF coming um, after him. But what he missed was all the flow of entrepreneurial activity that would come into a country that would make Bitcoin a national currency. And, uh, and I think El Salvador's got that. And I think the IMF um, loan is in much better shape because now 
I'm making a trip to El Salvador. All these other people are going to make trips to El Salvador. Entrepreneurs are going to go there. El Salvadorians are going to know more about a Bitcoin economy than anyone else because they will be they, they will be a leader in how you can move Bitcoin into your system. They, they will be the first to adopt Open Node for retailers. They'll be the first to to uh, create a system of accounting around Bitcoin. All of a sudden, that's going to be they could potentially be one of one of the richest countries in the world as we go forward. So um, I think it was a brilliant move. Mm -hmm. I think it was, um, you know, who was going to go to El Salvador before that? And it was a, it had been corrupt. And all of a sudden it's, I mean, now it's a, it's got a trusted currency. Now mm -hmm. it's got Bitcoin. They don't have to, they don't have to deal with sort of a, you know, government currency. Now they've got, they've got a new currency they can operate with. In fact, I'd love to operate a venture fund all in Bitcoin, where um, I pay, I, I invest in Bitcoin, they, the companies pay their employees and suppliers all in Bitcoin. And the whole thing is a closed loop on the blockchain so that everything's a smart contract. When a company sells out, it can, all the money goes through a natural waterfall into everybody's Bitcoin wallets. My investors are all paid exactly what they're supposed to be paid. All the um, we're paid exactly what we're supposed to be paid. The, the uh, companies get exactly what they're supposed to get. Um, and you build it all into software. It is so much more effective than going through transfer agents and lawyers and accountants and auditors and bookkeepers and whatever, whoever yeah. else gets in the way of this kind of progress. So yeah, huge breakthrough. And, um, and I did suspect that it was going to be a number of these smaller countries who were um, who were the first to move. It's just like in a startup, the small companies are the ones who are the first to adopt new technologies because the big countries or the big companies are like big boats. It's yeah. hard for them to move. Uh, the they can't just turning. turn on a dime and say, let's go, let's go do this unless they do it sort of in a skunk works. Because there was a, a story that I read too about Bitcoin Beach, also in, Sal in Salvador in 2018, with an experiment with a little uh, El Sante, I think, or El Zonte. And what, what I loved about that was they gave everybody $50. This is a bunch of California, uh, you know, sort of hippie guys, or whatever. And um, they paid also pay people. They, they encouraged the to, I, I said, to accept Bitcoin, and they gave them all Bitcoin. They also paid for things like, um, you know, life, life, uh, uh, lifeguarding or collecting rubbish. But the really interesting thing that I read about it, and I, I don't know how successful it was, but the one thing I loved about it, a local said, young people have, have hope. Before, their, their joy was to get across the border off into America, but now they can see they're part of a larger community. So I think you're right. It's actually very exciting. I, I, I love this stuff. So, you know, I, I think okay. if um, the U.S. government had any guts at all, they would have made those PPP loans all in Bitcoin. Um, and, and there's no reason they shouldn't do, you know, they've got another 3.4 trillion they're about to spend. That should all be put out in Bitcoin because then, <clears throat> then it, it retains its value and it doesn't, and, and it, it allows um, true honesty throughout the system. Um, you're not gonna see people trying to cheat it because you know, you get your Bitcoin wallet, your, here's your identity. Um, but you know, it does seem like the people who are running Washington are are, you know, way past their prime. They don't want change. No, they're not no. trying for change. But I think we're ready for change. This would be a really good time for an innovative leader to step up, step up and say, "Hey, we should we should have a Bitcoin economy. We should have our." Um, all of our uh, payments for whatever it is, for healthcare insurance and welfare and social security, all go out in, in Bitcoin so that we have a secure system. Um, we, we can identify, now there are great identity companies out there that will make it so that people, you know, can't get five welfare checks or whatever happens out there now. So this is a really exciting time. And, um, and I, I 
fear that the US is falling behind other countries because they're innovating around these new technologies and the US is not. Mm -hmm. The US government is not. The private sector sure is. Yeah. The entrepreneurs are, the, the businesses are, but um, the US government, uh, they, it's, they so big. it's so big, it's so big. Bloated and, yeah. and nobody can make a decision. And, and they're not, not a lot of innovative things going on, a lot more backbiting and not so much uh, looking toward the future. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to having somebody like uh, Suarez, the mayor of, um, of Miami or uh, become the president. And then all of a sudden we're gonna have somebody who is forward thinking recognizing the value of all these new technologies, recognizing that, that we don't want to fall behind. Yeah, yeah. And conversely then, what's your opinion of CBDCs? I mean, on the one hand, like for helicopter money, it's fast. Then the control of the CBD, the centralized aspect, do you have mixed feelings about them or do you think they're a part of the solution? Oh, I like all of it. I like every, every innovation that has happened around Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts. I like level two, level three, they're starting to have. Um, I, I, like, uh, I like the NFTs. I like all these things are starting to happen because they are, and whether it's a centralized new token or a decentralized token, I love decentralization, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I like, uh, you know, I like uh, Bitcoin Cash. I like the, the um, I like what Ripple is doing. I like what, the, um, I love what Aragon is doing, where they're they're creating a, a new form of liquid democracy. Um, I like what Tezos is doing, creating a, a new form of governance. Um, I I like what uh, I, you know. There are a, a number of really great innovations out there that are happening, uh, and uh, and. The reason I like Bitcoin the most yeah. is that it is completely decentralized and that it is uh, global and open and transparent. And the decentralization means that if one government like China says, no Bitcoin here, then Japan pops up and says, we're going to make Bitcoin a national currency. And then all of the, then there's a brain drain out of China and into Japan. So uh, so I think that um, governments that overregulate do it at their own peril, and I think uh, it's it's time for um, and and the U.S. government has done this balancing act. Uh, ideally, uh, they they operate with a very light touch, and if you have a very light touch, then great things can happen. I mean, if we had like regulated the internet when it had just gotten started. It, it, it would have just crushed us. We would have we would have lost all that economic value, all those jobs. We would have lost all that um, influence on the world. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Do yeah, you know what I, I love? You're, you're very, I love, I love your answer because I thought you were saying, yes, it's got definitely, you love everything. I don't, I don't mean that in a, you know, a, just sort of a, an unconditional way, but you, your passion is huge. So it brings me to a question, I think it's quite important. Because you are an important person, when you Google your name, we see your age. Apologies, you're 64. So whether you remember, you know, no, you... they got it wrong. Oh, great. Oh no, it's even worse. <laughs> Complain. Okay, but I wanted to ask you a question because I've been I'm doing another article too, but I'm looking at people because I'm 56, right? So I'm a, a bit old um, in in terms of the, the industry, and I'm a woman, so I'm kind of like going, I'm this old bird that's kind of going around. Oh, I love this. What are the impediments and how can you get over for older people saying, come on? I mean, like, you know, not necessarily to work, but just to un try to understand it. And it's, old folk aren't, I say old, and I use that, you know, very, very loosely. My mom's 91. She's bright as a button. But why, why are older people reluctant to, you know, what's that all about? Do you know? Um, well, yeah, I do. Um, older people uh, resist change. They don't want a lot of change. They kind of like it the way it is. Look, I'm, I'm living okay. I worked really hard to get where I am. I'm living okay. Don't change anything on me. And that's why you see guys like Warren Buffett and uh, you know the, the head of JP Morgan who control all the dollars 
not liking the idea of Bitcoin <laughs> rising above and beyond all of them. But look, if you're old and you, um, and you think you're old, then <laughs> you're too old. but if you're old, um, go get yourself a Bitcoin wallet. I mean, just do it. Yeah. Buy an NFT. Go try it. See what this is all about. I mean, it's the least you can do. And then all of a sudden you might get interested. And uh, it might help your pension. You know, if you're people are living 30 oh, years. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're thinking because your pension is going to um, decrease by inflation. And I mean, people haven't I've lived long enough to know what inflation does to all of these things, all these investments. What happens when inflation pops in? The worst thing that happens when you have inflation is that the um, it discourages innovation because people think if I build some value, the government's just gonna take it away from, from me because of inflation. It, they will just inflate. So I can't, I don't have a store of value. Um, now Bitcoin solves that problem, but inflation is, is very dangerous to innovation. It's dangerous to a lot of parts of uh, society because if you think you're you've earned a bunch of money and then it just disappears because of inflation it like drops 10 percent mm. a year or in argentina it's like 50 percent a year um there's no incentive to build any value because so you kind of live for the day so i would say yeah you've um your pension is at risk you should probably buy some Bitcoin just to hedge your pension, but you should also do it for the good of your brain plasticity. Mm, I like that. I mentioned earlier, so I said older folk, women, um, you're a third generation uh, financier. Your children are also, also financiers. Um, and with your daughter in particular, with Jessie, um, she invests in companies too as well. Does she, or maybe she doesn't, is there any difference in her investment patterns as a woman? Do you see anything differently or is it just all the same? Actually, I, I'm so proud of her every time I talk to her because I, I ask her questions about her business and I think, oh my gosh, this is all the thinking I went through when I was getting going. You know, it's like, oh God, I got that. I'm on the board of this company and the, the CEO's spending too much and, they, you know, she, she's on top of it. She is on it. Um, her, her, uh, branding is different. She's, she said, I'm only backing entrepreneurs who are women or women in the, in the team. And, uh, and that limits who she can back, but it doesn't change the nature of the business. It doesn't change how, what she has to think about where she has to go with it. She, um, she, does, she backs a lot of technology companies, a lot of really interesting businesses, and her results are good. I mean, that's what's really go, cool is that she, her results are good. Um, and then, of course, Adam uh, runs Boost, and that, that has been a rocket ship. Um, it's uh, uh, um, amazingly successful, and he, he uh, just backs science fiction he just says science fiction to reality i read that yeah that's interesting isn't it that's so your kids thing. have got and then, very unique and then billy approaches. worked with me yeah for four years and he started path ventures fairly recently um and going after uh consumer technology so they are they have focused on industries uh i have always kept myself a generalist but then i'll say okay if you're an entrepreneur like right now i'll say if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a business in um, in any way decentralizing government, I'm interested to see it. I think that might be a big industry. Decentralizing insurance, government, yeah. um, any of the ask really you, like, big industries. Then I'm I, I'd be very interested to talk to them. Yeah, because I think it's even like the state of California, you want to break it up into six different parts. I know that's your interest in the past. So do you think I'm going to ask you, is there in this beautiful decentralized disruptive future is there a role for government do you think it's more like the hyper local is that where we're going to have true government rather than the centralized body i i actually think that you need both you need local and you need um a, a 
federal. government or of a federal government. Um, but it will be very interesting. The local will be really tied to, you know, where you're allowed to build or how you're allowed to, um, you know, move around and that kind of thing. And the federal will be sort of a, a moral high ground. Uh, but I think that most government will be done offshore or uh, in, up in space where we, we will have virtual governance because uh, I can create an insurance company with surveillance tools and the internet and, uh, and you could uh, pay your premiums in Bitcoin and then even before you knew your house burned down, we will have put a bunch of Bitcoin in your wallet. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a much better insurance company than any, you know, one right now, it, they, if you issue a claim, it's a big fight and then it takes six months, you get a big headache. And then finally you get a, a check, that check. some sort of a compromise. Mm. But imagine getting the money right away. Yeah. may not be all the money you, you were hoping for, but you're getting money right away to get you through this period where your house is burned down or you've had a heart attack or you've whatever. And, and the surveillance can be on body, up in the air, by camera. I mean, many ways to surveil. And, uh, and then by doing that, you can provide great insurance. Well, what is government? But it's 85% insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't we just spin that part out and then anything that's land-based um, allow the government to operate? And by the way, I actually think that these big militaries are just tools of politicians and they're really, I actually think that we, um, it won't be long before there's so little difference between living on in one country or another, because we all have access to smartphones. We all can create businesses. They can spread all around the world. So you're gonna start seeing the world become much more even. Mm. So keeping people out of a country is probably gonna be less and less of a thing. And eventually uh, borders, it will be people of the world and we'll just go and people I'm hoping and I'm thinking that my grandchildren will ask me the question you know maybe I'll be dead but they'll ask me the question what are those things on the on these and I'll say that's that's customs buildings and they'll say well what were they for well it was to keep people from going across this little line and they'd say, well, that's stupid. And that I think will be what the, the next generation or the one after that will experience. They'll, they'll experience a world that is wide open. And while we're getting to that world, I actually think that we're, we're right now seeing nationalism and, and uh, patriotism and all that stuff um, and, and trade wars and all that stuff. It is not helping, but what it is, is the, the roar of the dying lion. So when you see a politician saying, oh, we got to, those guys, they're making trouble for us. Da, 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 da. You know, I think what happens there is you are seeing the roar of the dying lion. That's a dying lion. Um, the, the young driven lions, those guys are, are the ones who are saying, hey, you know, I don't care where you are. You could be in Timbuk, Timbuktu. If you're a good programmer, I want you on my team. If you're a good marketer, I want you on your, on my team. And uh, and being tied to a um, a physical presence is no longer relevant. And that's why I look at California and I think, how stupid is this state by putting up a bunch of laws and regulations around employment? because it's just gonna make sure that every business person wants to employ people outside of the state. Uh, you know, you start putting these regulations down, oh, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. 
As soon as you start piling those on, the business people go, well, wait a second. How do I work around this? Because this sure, sure isn't working for me. And so they might hire two people in California and 300,000 from Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. I have two last questions. I'm conscious of, of your time. One is long, one's short. Uh, when you've been asked many times about selling Bitcoin, would you sell Bitcoin? You go, why would I sell? Currency of the future for the currency of the past. We like swapping dollars for Confederate like it's dollars. even better than that now. It's Euros. Sort of it's sort of the currency of the now. The net, well, the now actually, you're right. Bitcoin is the currency of the now, and and fiat is the currency of the past. And I look and I think, I think, I mean, would I would I want to sell my euros for drachma or for for uh, French francs? No. Yeah. Irish I would pumps. want I would want to hold on to euros, but if I can hold on to Bitcoin, I would dump my euros. So I think that that is happening and as soon as i can buy this is the logic there as soon as i can buy my food my clothing my shelter with bitcoin and by the way i i bought a house and the guy asked me for bitcoin and i said no <laughs> but he said i'd take bitcoin <laughs> um, i i was going to donate to stanford and and um and they said no we want your bitcoin and i said no but, um, and now there are more and more stores opening up and shops opening up that are accepting Bitcoin because they can use open node and it saves them money. Um, and they get to store some of the Bitcoin because they like it. Um, in fact, I was at a barber in New York City and, and I said, do you take Bitcoin? And they said, yes. And I went, oh, I was sort of taken aback because it was sort of the first time I had heard yes. But that's starting to happen. And so once that happens, if, if I can buy my food, clothing, shelter, all for Bitcoin, why would I ever hold dollars? Dollars are subject to political whims. They get printed whenever the politician decides to print them. Uh, they, they just say, oh, okay, we have to make more of these. And then they make more and your dollars are worth less but nobody makes more Bitcoin. And that's the argument for a decentralized currency that doesn't print more of them, um, is that the, the, the money will be stored um, and, and you, get, you get the value of that stored um, money. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're better off operating in Bitcoin. So, I mean, the moment I can buy my food, clothing, shelter, and anything else I want with Bitcoin, I will uh, sell all my dollars into Bitcoin. Okay, that's interesting. My final question is, I didn't realize you have an honorary doctorate from Trinity College in Dublin. That's yeah. My, yeah, that's my old alma mater. So my question yeah. is, when are you next coming to Dublin and can we have a coffee? <laughs> I don't know. I might be in Dublin sometime. One of my good buddies, Patty Cosgrave, is uh, oh. from Dublin. And he, Are you going to the Web, Web Summit then? Yeah, but that that won't be in Dublin. That's in no, no, Portland. Lisbon, Lisbon. I'm going. To, I might see you there. I'm going to the Web Summit this uh, right. next month, no, November, November. Fantastic. So I might see you there. Oh, I, I knew Patty well, vaguely. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved your answers. I. Uh, Good questions, too. That was fun. I'll bet oh. people like your podcast. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I, I tried not to ask the obvious ones. Good. Send me a link. I'll, I'll post it up. Thank you. And I, I'll see you in Lisbon then. See you next month. See you in November at Web Summit. <laughs> Tell Patty I'm coming over. <laughs> yeah. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye.